We come again to the book of Philippians, and we will be spending some time in the book of Philippians and, and uh, finish up our study on finding, actually we have a ways to go before we finish the study, okay, but on finding joy in the real life battles. And today we talk about joy in humility from Philippians chapter 2. Humility, what a difficult subject humility is. Uh, ben Franklin said, a man wrapped up in himself makes a very small bundle. And isn't that the absolute truth, okay? Um, when you're caught up in yourself, you're not caught up in much. Humility is a very, very difficult sermon to preach on, and there's not a lot of material um, out there in the world, okay, on the subject of humility. Secular humility, especially, secular material on humility is especially hard to find. So I googled books on humility, because I'm thinking somebody has written a book on humility outside of Christian publications. I really did not find a single book, modern time book, written on the subject of humility. But certainly there are songs on humility, right? Because in the church we sing about everything, and yes, there are Christian songs on humility, but I really couldn't find any pop songs on the subject of humility, not a real popular subject, but then on the other hand, there's, there's um, uh, rap and rock songs about everything in life, right? So I googled um, uh, rock songs on humility and I heard my computer giggle. So I googled rap songs on humility, and it just bent over laughing, okay? Um, no way, Jose, basically, is what it said. Speeches on humility? <laughs> no, no. There's no guys that are standing up in Congress and talking about uh, the value of humility. It just isn't out there, okay? Humility as a virtue is a biblical teaching, but it's not a secular teaching. The secular world doesn't like the subject. However, there's this famous book edited by William. William Bennett that has all the virtues in it, right? All of the virtues. So it would seem like if we're going to find a virtue like humility, surely we could go to William Bennett's book that is just, it's, you know, for a long time it was on the top of the chart. Big, big seller. People loved the book and talked about it both in secular and Christian realms and, um, and all the various different topics. There they are, 10 of them in the book of, that, of virtues. Humility is not one of them. The world doesn't look on humility as a virtue. And yet the Bible speaks so much on the subject of humility. And so why is it? Why is it that there's such a difference between the two? Humility outside biblical teaching is generally thought of as failure. Did you ever think about that? It's generally thought of as failure. If you are humbled, you failed. If you are humiliated... We use that pretty much only in a negative setting, a negative connotation. We don't like to be humiliated. We don't like to say things like, what's, what's our middle name? And then to remember, oops, that, that wasn't what I really meant to say, okay? Um, we, we view those things, whether it's a slip of tongue or any kind of humiliation, as being a failure in life. Only Christians have the ability to truly understand humility. Only Christians have this understanding, have the ability. Here's why. Humility is, is, is a Christ-like feature. It's a Christ-like virtue. It's not because we're better than anyone else. It's because true humility is going to be found in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Now, I do believe that there have been, through, through the ages, some very humble people that maybe weren't even necessarily Christians, but it's rare. It's rare because the world really pushes this dog-eat-dog -dog mentality. The world really pushes this look-out-for-number-one num thinking. Um, I, I am responsible for my success, and I need to do whatever I can do to be on top of the pile of people. Whatever it takes to push myself up the ladder, whatever it takes for me to attain every single goal that I have and achieve every single desire that I have and become successful and become wealthy or whatever it is that I've defined success as being, I'm responsible for doing that. That's the way the world looks at it, okay? So, so in my process of Googling humble people, 
Simon Cowell. I mean, when we think of humility, does Simon Cowell come to mind? So I was kind of surprised when I read an article that talked about Simon Cowell's new found humility. I thought, wow, that's interesting. I got to see what that has to say. Because I never really picked up on a newfound humility with Simon Cowell, okay? But a while ago, he started his program, The X Factor. And the point of the article was he had newfound humility because the X Factor's ratings were lower than he said they were going to be. Apparently, he forecasted that 20 million people would be, would be tuning in to watch The X Factor, would be one of the most successful programs on TV, and in fact, only 13 million people signed in, 7 million less than he predicted, and so the article was his new found humility. What was the point of the article? The point of the article was he was wrong. They were saying humility is being wrong. Humility is being a failure. We often talk about, about circumstances where maybe a politician is humbled because the truth about him or her comes out into the press and they're forced into an apology and a resignation and they are being humbled. They're being exposed, not necessarily being humbled. Preachers, evangelists, televangelists being humbled because they were exposed, not because they were humble. There's a big difference between the world's view, you are humbled because you were exposed, you were humbled because you failed, and humility as a spiritual virtue. In all of my searching online, I do think that this particular person has a past, a humble past a past with humbleness in it. This is a quote from when he was still bishop before he became Pope Francis. He said, Jesus teaches us another way. Go out. Go out and share your testimony. Go out and interact with your brothers. Go out and share. Go out and ask questions. Become the word in body as well as spirit. I like that. I like a pope that goes down to the front desk of the hotel and pays his own bill takes the cab, walks the streets, acts like a regular person. I like that. I do think that Pope Francis is truly a humble individual. Now, you might be shocked that I, an evangelical pastor, am talking about a pope, but I'm talking about a man. <laughs> He's a man, okay? He gets up in the morning and puts on his shoes like I got up in the morning and put on my shoes. But, he's, but he has a good record as a humble man of God in his past. You see, Jesus is our example of humility. And so I want us to take a look at what the scripture says to us, first of all, in our text. And then we'll come back to the subject. So if you have your Bibles open to Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, would you stand together with me as we read the word? If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him, him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. May the Lord bless his word. You may be seated. Let me define humility. Many, many years ago, in fact back in the 70s, um, I was studying this along with other um, virtues in scripture and ran across a definition that, that I remember after 40 years for some reason and, and it is that, that humility 
is realizing that God and others are responsible for the achievements in my life. And I quoted that many, many times through the years, and I still believe it. I still believe it, but I think it falls short. And I have since added on a second half of that. Humility is realizing that God and others are responsible for the achievements in my life and that responding to God and others is the chief purpose of my life. In fact, if I just realize that God and others are responsible for my achievements and then I do nothing, nothing out of humility, then humility is absent. It has a good understanding but a bad practice to it. Humility is understanding, number one, that I am gifted because of others in God and my gift has a purpose to it and my purpose is to be used for the glory of God and others. Think about that. You know, our, our president, um, not too long ago, uh, um, tried to make a point that I think he was trying to make a good point, okay, except I, I don't know, it got all distorted. But he was talking about, you know, if, if you're successful, somebody else is responsible, and the, the, um, for, for your success. Well, the press picked up on that, and Christians picked up on it, and everybody picked up on it. And, and I remember when I first heard him say that, I thought, you know, he's on to something here. He's on to something. And I remember the first thing that popped into my mind is that's sort of close to the definition of humility, okay? Um, if, if I am successful at something, it's not me. It's God and others that help form who I am, I got my talent from where? I didn't conjure up a talent on my own, whatever that talent may be. God has given me a talent. God has anointed me with an ability. And what I am and what I become, God is responsible for, okay? So he's responsible in that aspect for my achievements. But I also think this. I don't know if you guys ever do this, but I've told you before, I'm really into ancestry, my studying my ancestry. Uh, where did my relatives come from? Who were they? And, and uh, the oldest line that I can follow through my mother's mother's family, my maternal grandmother, I can trace back to the year 1040. 1040. And it, um, there was one of my relatives was a lieutenant who served with William the Conqueror. Yeah, and came from um, Normandy across the English Channel into England. And because he was a lieutenant, when William the Conqueror conquered England, he became a property owner. And because he was a property owner, there were taxes. And so from the year 1040 all the way through, you can trace that family and the taxes and the record book and, um, and all of the names of all of the people that came along. It's amazing to me, okay? There's other parts of my family that I get stuck right, like around 1900. But that one part is really cool that I can trace it back so far. Do you know that to this very day, there are, there are genes that are in my body that have been passed on to me by my relatives that, in fact, go back to Adam and Eve, okay? But, but I can oftentimes when I'm doing something, sometimes when I say something, I don't know if you ever do this, but I'll say something and then I'll stop and I'll think, boy, that sounded like my mom. Or, wow, that sounded like my dad, or that was my dad's way of doing it, okay? I have stuff that's been passed on to me by my mother and my father and my grandparents and, and, and great-grandparents and all the way back. And so I like this definition. What is humility? Humility is realizing it didn't start here. It didn't start here. Humility is realizing that God and others are responsible for the achievements in my life for giving me the stuff. Now, maybe I conjured up some motivation and, and um, some activity and some drive and some desire, but God and others are responsible for the achievements in my life and that responding back to God and to others is the chief purpose of my life. The opposite of humility is pride. And sometimes it's easiest to understand a virtue when we look at the opposite of the virtue, and there's lots of good illustrations, biblical and extra-biblical, on the subject of pride. Nebuchadnezzar comes to my mind from the book of Daniel as one of the greatest illustrations of a man of pride. You remember studying Nebuchadnezzar back when you were in grade school, high school? And we learned that Nebuchadnezzar had a great empire. He was emperor over, over a Babylon and is known today as having one as building one of the seven 
ancient wonders of the world, the uh, hanging towers of Babylon. Well, it's that same Nebuchadnezzar that comes to us in the book of Daniel because it was during that time that Israel that was captured, Judah was captured and taken into captivity. And the prophet Daniel and the prophet Ezekiel were um, part of that captivity that was taken to Babylon. During that time, Nebuchadnezzar, as the emperor, looked at his vast empire, everything he had conquered, everything he'd achieved, all of the wealth that he had accumulated, and all of the buildings that he had built, aqueducts, massive buildings, the palace that he lived in, and the great hanging towers of Babylon. And one day he looked out across his mighty, mighty kingdom and he said, Is this not the great Babylon I have built as royal residence for my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Nebuchadnezzar claimed success, responsibility himself for everything he had achieved. No one helped him. <laughs> No one aided him. No one built it for him. He said, I did all of this. I am responsible for everything I am and everything I have and everything that exists. The Bible says that while the words were still on his lips, God had something to contribute. And God said, Nebuchadnezzar, your royal authority is taken away from you as of right now this moment. You think you achieved this all on your own? Well, watch this. I'm going to take it away from you all at once. And you're going to live with wild animals, live as a wild animal with wild animals, and you're going to eat grass. And you're going to do that for seven years until you humble yourself and you say, I was wrong. Nebuchadnezzar becomes the great example of pride for us, okay? Giving himself credit for everything that he had achieved. There's another guy in scripture, angel, fallen angel, by the name of Lucifer. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 14 that Lucifer said, he said, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise up my throne. I will be like God. Lucifer, who is the devil, he is Satan. He is the deceiver. Lucifer's fault was that he exalted himself and he exalted himself above God. And he said, I will be God. I will conquer God and I will be God and all the world and all creation will bow down before me. I will be their God. In fact, in Ezekiel chapter 28, we read that Satan became proud because of his appearance Ezekiel tells us that Satan, in his pre-fallen state, was a beautiful, magnificent angel. We tend to like to think of um, Lucifer as ugly, don't we? We see those pictures that people portray him in, where he's standing there with a um, pitchfork and kind of flaming red colors symbolizing hell, I guess, and an overall ugly appearance on his face. Did you watch the Bible? They really picked an ugly guy, I thought, um, to be play the part of the devil, Lucifer, in a hood, a wrinkled face. But you know what? When you read the Bible, folks, when you read the Bible, you find out that Lucifer, the devil, is an attractive person. In the Old Testament, it says he was beautiful. He was gorgeous in his creation. And many people in the world today look at Lucifer and see him as an attractive alternative. That's the way I want to go. I got to tell you, if Lucifer showed up looking like the Lucifer they used in the Bible, we'd all scare away and say, no, no. But no, he looks really good to us. Paul said he masquerades as an angel of light. When we read about angels of light or in light in scripture, that's always an attractive thing. Remember at the tomb, there was an angel there appearing as light. Lucifer was caught up in his own appearance, but it was a source of his pride. So I want to share three things about humility this morning. First of all, humility has a perspective. 
And that's the first four verses of the text that is before us. Humility has a perspective. Humility looks at things with a certain perspective in mind. And Paul starts this, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1. And he says, if you've learned anything from Christ, if you've learned anything at all, you know that little Greek word, if, can sometimes easily be translated since. Since you have learned something. James uses it, if any lacks wisdom, since you lack wisdom. It's just as good of a translation, okay? It's not a if anybody does. We do, don't we? We do. Have we learned anything from Christ? Paul's writing to the church. He's writing to the church at Philippi, a very faithful, godly church. And they have learned things from Christ. And Paul says, if you've learned anything from Christ, have you gotten any encouragement, folks? Have you ever been encouraged by the Lord Jesus Christ in your life? Have you ever been encouraged by the word of God? Have you ever been encouraged by songs that we sing here or songs that you hear on Christian radio or songs that you just sing to yourselves, praise songs? Have you ever been encouraged by the blessing of other believers that have come along to you and maybe shared a word or shared a prayer or just shared a thought with you and encouraged you in the Lord? Paul says, if you've received anything from Christ, if you've gotten ever encouraged from Christ, if you've had any comfort in your times of distress, in your times of hurt, your times times of need, in your times of sorrow, if any comfort has ever come to you through Jesus Christ, any fellowship, that's our first name. Fellowship. Fellowship, koinonia is the Greek word. Okay? It's talking about being in common, being one together in the presence of Jesus Christ. If the Lord has come to you and been with you and you felt his presence and you felt his closeness and you felt his ministry in your heart and soul, if there's any tenderness, sometimes the world can be quite condemning. Sometimes our best friends can be quite condemning. But Jesus is the one who kneels down, takes a stick, draws in the dirt, stands up, puts his arm around our shoulders and says, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He's a tender, loving Lord to us. Any mercy? Mercy. Mercy is not giving us what we deserve to get. And I got to tell you that every one of us are recipients in Jesus Christ of his mercy at every moment. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. And because the Bible says that we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory, we deserve punishment. But Jesus took the punishment on himself. So Paul says, if you've received anything from Jesus, anything from Jesus, any encouragement, any comfort, any fellowship, any tenderness, any mercy, if you've learned anything from your walk with Jesus, oops, I got that slide in twice. There we go. Then be like-minded. Be like Jesus. Have the same mind, the same perspective as Jesus has. The same love, agape love, Christ love. The same spirit, being one soul, being of the same heart with Jesus. One purpose, one objective in life. Humility, humility, here it is. Here it is right down where the rubber meets the road. Humility is is being toward others as Christ is toward me. Being toward you as Christ is toward me. Paul says, if you've learned anything from Jesus, have this mind in you. Being toward others. I'm going to get more specific on this in a moment, but being toward others as Christ is toward me. Then he goes on and he says, don't do anything out of rivalry or jealousy you know think about that what did Jesus do out of rivalry or jealousy what did Jesus ever want that other people had he considered others he looked to the interest of others Jesus didn't do anything out of rivalry or jealousy therefore Therefore, folks, humility also has a purpose. Not only a perspective. Jesus didn't compete with anybody to get to the cross. Jesus didn't compete with anybody to get whipped 
with 39 lashes. Jesus didn't compete with anybody to be separated from the Father and cry out in the agony of the moment, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus didn't compete with anybody to bear the sins of all the world. There was nobody interested in competing. Jesus had a perspective. Jesus had a purpose. And his purpose was to honor God and to serve others. When Jesus went to the cross of Calvary, he went to the cross to honor God and to serve you and me. He went there for us. He took our place. He took all the bad things that we could have the good things. He took the curse that we could have the blessing. He took the judgment that we could be set free. Humility, humility considers the significance and the needs of others. Why did Jesus come to this earth? Because there was a need, folks. Because there was a need. The proud care only about themselves. The proud only look to themselves. The proud only concerned about themselves. The proud only concerned about their own comfort. The proud are only concerned about what is good for them. My way, my idea, my feelings. Not so with Jesus. This wasn't about, about his way. It was about ours. Not about his idea, ours. Not about his feelings, our feelings. Our need. Reaching out to us. The humble. Think of others. So you see, humility is not just a mindless state of existence. Humility isn't failure. Humility is having the mind of Christ and the purpose of the Lord Jesus Christ. The humility of Jesus had a specific purpose, okay? And it's opposite most of our thinking. He laid aside equality. Look at, look at again, in your, in your Bible, in verses 6 and 7 and 8. Being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. What are my rights? Wait a minute. What do I deserve? Jesus didn't consider his rights. He didn't consider what he deserved to have. He didn't consider being God a thing to hold on to. In fact, literally, literally the Greek word, Jesus didn't consider being God something to steal. <laughs> it's not what he wanted. He wanted what was best for you and for me. He laid aside equality, he gave up his position, he gave up his rights, and he became a human being. He became a human being. Being. Definition. The definition of humility. The workings of humility. To lay aside equality. To lay aside my position. To lay aside my rights. To stoop down. To stoop down. Through the ages, there have been men and women of God who have served around the world. Not just missionaries. People right here in San Antonio. But as a boy growing up in a church and hearing the story of missionaries and how they laid themselves aside because there were lost and dying people in need of the message of Jesus Christ for salvation. Gave up their nice house, gave up their nice car, gave up their nice job, gave up everything and moved into a hut someplace in a desolate part of the world because somebody needed Jesus. Now that's not the only way to be humble, folks. And I'm not saying that we all have to do that. It's not the only way to be humble. But Jesus does call upon us to have his mind and to have his purpose. And it's not about my rights. It's about the needs. And Jesus suffered on the cross. The greatest humility. The incarnation the incarnation is the greatest act of humility the world has ever seen. And it's why nobody writes anything on the subject, and nobody writes any rap songs or rock songs or any other songs, or writes books and it's not included in the Book of Virtues because it's so hard to comprehend the incarnation. What is, do you understand the incarnation? 
Well, let me ask it in a different way. How many of you read Facebook? Okay, a few of you. How is Jesus like a can of chili? I put that question on Facebook a couple of, few days ago. How is Jesus like a can of chili? Do you understand the incarnation? Look at the word. Look at the word. Did that turn red? Yes. Carne. Carne. Do you know what carne is? Chili con carne. What is that, guys? With meat. What is the, yeah, there you go. What is the incarnation of Jesus Christ, God, with meat? Same word. Same word. It's a Latin word, okay? Latin heritage to the word. God with meat. God took on meat. God took on humanity. That's what the incarnation's about. Every Christmas, I have, I'll have somebody, and, and, and oftentimes people have been believers for a long, long time. They'll say things like, I don't understand the incarnation. I really don't understand what that word means. Well, there it is. There it is. Carne with meat. Jesus became a human being. He laid aside heaven. He laid aside all the resources of heaven. He laid aside all the wonders of heaven. He laid aside all the wealth of heaven and took on meat and became a human being. Because we have need. What makes me grumble and complain the most? <laughs> you guys see that? My wife raised her hand. <laughs> if I was giving an altar call, I'd expect you to be here. <laughs> I was just thinking about this week. That this week, you know why? Because if I really want to examine my heart and its level of humility, let me just look at the things that irritate me. And then I see the difference between pride and humility. I'm telling people twice. I told you this already. <laughs> Having to go out of my way because of the failures of others. People who go too slow in front of me. Gets better. People who go too fast behind me. What's the hurry back there? Fixing a mess that someone else created. Other people's lack of planning. When I was college president, I had a sign hanging on my computer. Poor planning on your part does not constitute an emergency for me. I got to tell you, when I think of pride versus humility, someone being less than I think they should be is pride. When I can't be patient with the humanity of another person, that's pride. Humility, being toward Jesus, or being toward others as Jesus is toward me, that's humility. Now I wonder, in heaven, In Jesus' office, on the great computer, does he have a sign that says poor planning on your part doesn't constitute an emergency for me? <laughs> I don't think so. I think he's got that sign. Poor planning on your part does constitute my emergency. You see, poor planning on humanity's part did constitute an emergency for Jesus Christ. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I'm going to back up. Whoop, too far. Praise God that Jesus never comes to me and says, Russell, I told you this already. And, and, and now I got to go down there to earth because you messed up? Again? Did you have a plan? <laughs> now I got to come and save you from that horrid plan you had? No. Praise God. Praise God. That's not the attitude of Jesus toward me. I better finish up. The last thing I want you to know is humility has a promotion. It has a promotion. I got one of the strongest arguments, I think, for the truth 
of the Bible that 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 man didn't man didn't come up with this God idea because we wouldn't create a humble God. We wouldn't do that. When Paul wrote to Philippians, Nero was the greatest name on earth. He ruled the earth. He was the strongest and richest. It was the strongest and richest empire on earth. And at every single public event, the people had to bow their knees. They didn't get to. They had to bow their knees and raise their voice to declare Nero was Lord. The Bible says that God exalted Jesus, verse 9, to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you, do you realize that there is coming a day when every single knee, every single knee will bow and every single tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord? Guess what? Even Nero. Even Nero. Even those people that don't believe Jesus exists. People that are sure there is no God one day are going to bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So will you bend your knee to Jesus? That's not the question. The question is not, will you bend your knee to Jesus? The question is, when will you bend your knee to Jesus? In this life for salvation or on the other side of the grave for condemnation? Today as a friend of Jesus, then as a foe. Today for your joy, then for your shame. And not only was Jesus promoted those who are humble in Christ Jesus will also be promoted one day. And Peter says, all of you clothe yourselves with humility because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may exalt you in due time. Those of you like me that grew up in the church, we sang songs. A few weeks ago, I showed you a little um, thing I put together on Horatio Spafford, the author of It Is Well With My Soul. One of the authors of many of my favorite songs, both the words and the tunes, is a man by the name of Philip Bliss. If you grew up in the church, you sang his songs. In fact, if you were here on Good Friday, Ty sang A Man of Sorrows. Hallelujah, what a savior. It's a Philip Bliss song. Philip Bliss was a very humble man. Let me tell you about him. Philip Bliss was born into very humble beginnings. He was born July 9, 1838, in a log cabin in Clearfield County, Pennsylvania, to parents who taught him to love the Lord and to love music. Philip Bliss was uneducated for the first 10 years of his life. He grew up with a Bible as his only textbook and his mother as his only teacher. From a very young age, Philip was drawn to Jesus and music. His parents sang and taught him what they could. At age 11, he left home to make a living for himself as a logger. He spent the next five years in lumber camps and sawmills and walked with Jesus throughout this rough environment. Between these jobs, he would attend school and study music. He was also active in ministry throughout Methodist revival services. At age 17, he took the final steps to attain his credentials and he became the schoolmaster at Hartsville, New York. With the encouragement of friends and mentors, he became a music teacher in Rome, Pennsylvania. A few years later, he was married to Lucy, the love of his life, and struck out as an itinerant music teacher from town to town. This changed when his wife's grandmother gave him money to attend a formal music academy in New York. In 1864, at age 26, they moved to Chicago and he became widely known as a teacher, a singer, and composer. For the next eight years, he was very well known nationally and financially successful. Life was going very well for him. Throughout this time, he developed a friendship with a great evangelist preacher, D.L. Moody, and his associate, Daniel Whittle. They challenged him to leave his business and work with them. After a number of years, Bliss decided to join Whittle at an evangelistic meeting. He sang one of his songs and numerous people felt the conviction of sin and surrendered their lives to Jesus. Despite his success financially, as well as an educator and songwriter, in humility he walked away from his business and began full-time work as an evangelist alongside Whittle and Moody. He traveled with them for the next two years, seeing many lives transformed for Jesus. In 1876, Bliss conducted a service with 800 inmates of a Michigan prison. 
he sang Man of Sorrows, one of his last hymns. As he sang this beautiful expression of Christ's humility and sacrifice, many of the prisoners openly wept and gave their lives to Jesus. No one could have known this would be his last public performance. After celebrating Christmas with his family in Pennsylvania, Bliss boarded a train to Chicago to sing at a New Year's service for Moody. It was snowing heavily when he came to that bridge in Ohio. After the bridge collapsed, the train fell and burst into flames. Bliss initially survived by being thrown from the train, but with his wife on board, Bliss, like Jesus, became obedient even to death to save his wife. He rushed back into the burning train, and both he and Lucy were consumed in the fire, and their bodies were never recovered. Found in his trunk, which somehow survived the crash and fire, was a manuscript bearing the lyrics of his last song, I Will Sing of My Redeemer. Philip Bliss, both in life and death, was a humble man who consistently considered others before himself. Deal Moody said this of his friend, in my estimate, he was the most highly honored of God of any man of his time as a writer and singer of gospel songs, and with all his gifts, he was the most humble man I ever knew. I loved him as a brother. Was he a humble man because he died in a train crash? No. Because he gave up his job and his income for musical ministry purposes? No. Those things were contributors. He was a humble man because he saw people in need and said, God's given me a talent, and my parents have passed a talent on to me, and I want to use it to help others find Christ. See, humility doesn't mean that you quit your job this week. It doesn't mean that you give up your, your life to death this week. Humility means that when we see those opportunities to lay aside our rights, to lay aside our privileges, to lay aside our comforts, to lay aside even our feelings, to lay aside our frustrations, maybe to pick up after somebody, maybe to say a kind word to a cruel person, maybe to pray for somebody who you know would never pray for you, to reach out to someone in need and say, I'm going to do this because Jesus would do it. I love you because Jesus loves you. To be Jesus to be his hands, to be his feet, to be his voice, to be his heart. That's what humility is all about. Pray together with me. Father, I pray that you would convict us of those areas of our life that make us grumble the most because oftentimes that's the area maybe where we need to, to say, wait, there's a lot of pride here and not a lot of humility. Enable us to have this mind in us that was also in Christ Jesus, that we lay ourself aside for the glory of God and the blessing of others. In Jesus' name, amen.